Well, Perry Creek, I do want to say happy Father's Day to you. Um, I hope you have some good plans today, maybe to spend some time with your kids, maybe you're going to cook out, uh, maybe to honor your dad on this special day. And Perry Creek, since it's Father's Day, I thought I would start our sermon with a very dad kind of a topic. No, it's not, not dad jokes. It's not. Um, and it, that is warnings. Okay, I want to talk to you about the warning lights on your car. So, you know, my dad taught me to take care of my car. I once saw a card, a Father's Day card that said, a dad is nature's way of reminding you to check the oil. And it is true, okay? So modern cars have several useful warning lights, but you have to know what the symbols mean, and many people don't. So I thought I would just show you some of these warning signs and explain what they mean so that you can impress your dad when you talk to them today. So let's just look at these, okay? So first, this one means your seatbelt has trapped your arms and it's not safe to drive. <laughs> All right. Uh, this one means Sauron has taken over your car. For those of you who are Lord of the Rings fans, uh, let's see. This, ne this one's uh, be careful, there is a cyclone in your car. All right. Um, this, Kelly knows this one. This is tea time. Okay. <laughs> right? Uh, this one, the, the one down there, that means there's a fountain in range. Keep driving. And this one means there is an owl spying on you. Okay? <laughs> Okay, now that, that was a little humor, very little, all right? Uh, but seriously, you know, these warning lights are useful things, right? You really do want to know what they mean. They tell us that we need to look at something to make sure the car is okay, to make sure we're safe. You know, last year I had a time when my engine was overheating and I didn't realize it. I had a time when my right front tire was just about flat and I didn't feel it and the warning lights on my car helped me. They encouraged me to take a look and make sure everything was okay. So warnings can be useful things. And Perry Creek, for the next two weeks, we are going to look at some warnings. So we are coming to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon that Jesus ever preached. And for almost three chapters, Jesus has been teaching us how to live as citizens of his kingdom. So if you remember, he gave us eight Beatitudes where he blessed the things in our lives that please him. He gave us uh, six antitheses. These are where he sort of reinterpreted the Old Testament law for us. And then he redefined three great religious acts of giving and praying and fasting. So Jesus has been telling us how to live as citizens of his kingdom. Well, as we come to the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount... Jesus is going to give us four warnings. He's going to give us four words of caution about our discipleship. And these are going to function much the way the warning light on your car does. You may not like it when it goes off, but it's useful, okay? They're going to give us four specific things to look at, four questions we should ask to check and see if we're okay, if we're safe if we're truly citizens of Jesus' kingdom. So Jesus is going to conclude this sermon with some warnings. And that's what we're going to start looking at today. So let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 7, verses 13 to 23. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 to 23, or the words will be up on the screen as we read them. So we're going to look at the first three of Jesus' warnings today. We'll look at the final one next week. And today, as we look at these three warnings... Jesus will give us really three questions. So three questions we can ask to see if we're truly part of his kingdom. And let me just say, if you're here today, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been coming to church, whether this is your first Sunday in a long time or ever, or whether you've been coming for years, I hope you'll really stop and ask yourselves these questions today. They are indicators of your spiritual life and health, and anyone can ask them. So I first encountered this passage and asked myself these questions when I was nine years old. And that was the time when I truly became a follower of Jesus. So these are important questions, all right? All right, so let's read our passage in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 20, uh, 13. Jesus says this, Enter by the narrow gate. 
For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This, concerning as it is, is the word of the Lord. So Jesus gives us three very serious warnings in this passage. He encourages us to ask three diagnostic questions about our spiritual life and health. So let's just look at these one at a time, all right? So the first question that Jesus encourages us to ask is this, am I choosing the right path? Am I choosing the right path? path. So Jesus encourages us to ask ourselves if we're on the right path. So look at what Jesus says in verses 13 and 14 once again. He says, enter by the narrow gate for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. So notice that Jesus tells us here that there are two paths we can take on our spiritual journey. There are two ways that we can go. So path number one, the, path that Jesus, the first path that Jesus describes in detail, is desirable in almost every way. Right? I mean, think about it. Uh, you know, Jesus says here, the gate to path number one is wide. You can take on path one whatever you want to take on it. He says the way on path one is easy. So the rises and drops on that path are gentle. The footing on that path is sure there's easy walking. And Jesus says the road on this path is popular. There are lots of people on path number one. Okay, so that's path number one, the easy path. And I have to tell you that I recently went on a path that is like that path. So, you know, several weeks ago, I was in Nevada for a family wedding, and my best friend, Carrie, from Kansas, uh, called me and said, I'm going to meet you in Nevada, and I want, you to, uh, I want to take you to a couple of my favorite places in the U.S. So, Carrie picked me up, and he drove me to Arches National Park in Utah. How many of you, have any of you been here? Okay, I see a few hands there, all right, to a place that is called Delicate Arch. So, maybe you've seen this. Um, this is on the uh, Utah license plate. And I have to say that path was fun. So the entrance was easy. Anyone could go. The path up to the arch was really wide. It was really a nice, gentle slope. Lots of people talking and laughing on the way there. It was an easy path. Okay, so that's very much like the first path that Jesus describes here. But notice... There's a second kind of path that Jesus describes, a very different path. So Jesus says this path is not so desirable. The gate is narrow, so you have to leave stuff behind. The way is very hard, and the word that Jesus uses uh, that's translated hard here often refers to persecution or mistreatment. So this path is constricted. It has steep climbs and sharp drops. The walking is hard and at times dangerous. And as opposed to the popular path, this path can be quite lonely. 
Jesus says there are few who find it. So that's the second path. Now I have to tell you that I also went on a path like this with my friend Carrie. So, you know, after Carrie had lured me into a false sense of security by taking me to Delicate Arch, he took me to a different park in Utah called Zion National Park. And when we got out of the car, Carrie said to me, we're going to climb this. Okay, the this that he is talking about um, is a, a, a path called Angel's Landing, which is a silly name. It should be called Devil's Drop or <laughs> Idiot Ridge or something like that, okay? Because this trail is a 1,500-foot climb. By the way, that's just the top of the thing. It starts way, 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 way down, further down than you can see. So 150 stories. So we hike to the back of the mountain to start our climb. So we get all the way around there, and then this is what I saw. See that path there? Pretty serious, right? Um, uh, but here's the thing. That is not the path to Angel's Landing. That is the path you take to get to the path to Angel's Landing, all right? Uh, you know, you have to have a permit to climb Angel's Landing. So there's fewer people, and I quickly discovered that the actual path to Angel's Landing is a ridge about four feet wide with a 1,500 foot drop on either side. It was terrifying. So much of the path has chains so that you don't, there we are, so you don't lose your balance, um, but there were places where there were no chains. So you're walking rock to rock with this giant drop on either side. Um, there were places where I almost literally could not make my feet move. I'm just sitting there going, I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> um, but I did it, okay. Now, we did make it to the top. So this is my friend, Carrie. There's the bottom, way, way, way down there. There's Carrie. But listen, that path, the path to Angel's Landing, is very much like the second path that Jesus describes in our passage. Because the second path that Jesus describes, a path where you make a deliberate choice to be like Jesus. A path where you're willing to suffer for righteousness sake. A path where you choose to be salt and light to a dark and corrupt world. A path where you are radically truthful with yourself and others. A path where you love your enemies. A path where you trust God with everything you have. That's the kind of path that Jesus is talking about here. And you know, I kept thinking as I was hiking this path to Angel's Landing, this is so much like discipleship. You know, there were times where the going was easy and I could kind of catch my breath. There, there were times where, I, you know, I was encouraged because I could look back and see how much progress I had made. There were times where the view was breathtaking. And I just realized I'm seeing things that very few people get to see. And discipleship can be like that, right? But sometimes, many times, the way was just hard. It required discipline. It was challenging. There were times when I was exhausted or, or scared. And there were times when all I could do was follow Carrie's lead. There were times when I could tell myself, don't think about, do not think about the drop, okay? Don't think about the danger. Don't even think about what's 50 feet ahead. Just look at his feet and walk where he is walking. Jesus says that's what the path of discipleship is like. The gate is narrow. The way is hard. And it's not so popular. So here's the question that Jesus wants us to ask ourselves as we look at this passage. Does that description in any way resemble your spiritual life? Are you choosing the right path? Have you ever had times when you had to leave things behind to follow Jesus? Have you ever had times when that caused you to go to places that weren't so easy? I, I get it. I get it. There are times when we catch our breath. We see our progress. We get this eternal view. There are lots and lots of good times in following Jesus. But have you ever followed Jesus to the point that it cost you something? Have you ever followed him when it was less popular? When it took courage? 
Have you ever been through a time when all you could do was keep your eyes on Jesus and walk where he has walked and put one foot in front of the other? Guys, Jesus says that's what discipleship is like. He compares it to that second path and he challenges us to examine ourselves and look at our lives and see if it's ever really cost us anything to follow him. Have you ever given up anything for Jesus? Has it ever been hard? Because hear me, if you've never experienced that, you might not be on the right path. I don't mean that it's always supposed to be miserable, but we cannot live out the Sermon on the Mount. We cannot follow Jesus and always be on the easy path. He's not on that path. Jesus is on the hard path. That's the one he took in his ministry. That's the one where he'll meet us. And that is the one that he'll lead us down if we follow him. So please hear me. This is the only path that leads to life. Right? Notice the second path has very little to commend it. You know, the first path is ideal. The second path has nothing of value except the destination. It's the only one that leads to life. So the first warning that Jesus gives us is to make sure we're on the right path, to just look at our life. I'm not saying that it has to be miserable. I'm not saying you have to go look for that every chance you have. But are you following Jesus to the hard places? Okay, so firstly, we should ask ourselves, am I choosing the right path? But there's a second question that Jesus encourages us to ask here, and it's this. Am I following the right prophet? Am I following the right prophet? So look at what Jesus says in verse 15. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So Jesus says we should be on guard for certain prophets. And when Jesus uses the word prophet there, he doesn't mean like um, somebody who wears a robe and predicts the future and does miracles, okay? When, When Jesus talks about a prophet here, what he's talking about is someone we choose to follow spiritually. Somebody that we look up to. Someone who is a spiritual authority in our lives. So for some of you, it could be your pastor, but it could also be your small group leader, or it could be somebody who's discipling you one-on-one, or it could even be somebody that you watch on YouTube, okay? YouTube, I said that strangely. Anyway, somebody who's teaching or preaching you follow on TV or the radio, okay? When Jesus talks about a prophet, he's talking about anybody that you hand the keys of your spiritual life over to. That's what a prophet is in this context. And Jesus informs us here that there are some prophets we should not follow. Right? So there are some prophets that are really not there to feed the flock. They're not there to protect the flock. They're not there to be a part of the flock. Really, they're not there for the flock in any good way. Jesus calls them ravenous or hungry wolves. And the idea is not just that they're violent or destructive and want to tear up everything they can. Rather, what he means is they feed off the flock. Okay, so they're not there for what they can do for the flock. They're there for what the flock can do for them. They're not there for what they can give to the flock. They're there for what they can get from the the flock. So these prophets have an insatiable appetite. And And it can be for all sorts of things. Right? For some, it's money. There are prophets who want to use God's people to get rich. For others, it's praise. They want people to like them. Okay? Now listen, I think most guys that go into the ministry, including me, struggle with that a little bit. You know, you're going, I don't like to be disliked. But for some people, that's the total motivation for their ministry. They're kind of like a praise junkie. For some people, it's obedience. They crave authority. Maybe they never got to be the line leader, okay? Maybe being in the HOA isn't enough for them. So they decide they want to be a spiritual authority. Uh, For some, it's sex. They get people to trust them and then they abuse them. 
But whatever it is, these leaders have an appetite for. They are, they are not feeding the flock. They are false prophets. And Jesus tells us here to be careful. Because this kind of leader can do a lot of spiritual damage. They're, they're not going to grow us in the gospel because their mind is not on the gospel. Right? What they're thinking about is what they have an appetite for. So they may tell people what they want to hear. You know, tell them, hey, go ahead, take that r- wide road. That's a nice shot. That, that's good. Okay, that's what the, old te- the false prophets in the Old Testament used to do. Or they may focus on their list of rules so that they can be the authority. Right? That's what the false prophets in Jesus' day, the Pharisees, did. Right? But what, whatever it is that they focus on, it's not the gospel. So that's why they can do a great deal of spiritual harm. That's why Jesus says, watch out for these people. Okay, so how do we actually recognize these false prophets? How do we know who they are? Because Jesus has just said that we're not going to recognize them by their appearance. Right? He said they come to you in sheep's clothing, so they're not going to look like wolves. So how do we recognize them? Well, look at what Jesus says in verses 16 to 20. He says, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? No. Are figs gathered from thistles? No. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear good fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear... uh, uh, You know what I'm saying. Okay. And then uh, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. I don't know how many different ways Jesus just said it there, but he's saying we're going to recognize them by their fruit, by the things that grow out of their ministry over time, right? So Jesus is saying, don't look at the suit they wear. Look at the fruit they bear. See what I just did there? Kind of a rhyme kind of thing. Anyway, um, he says we should look at their fruit. So look at, the, look at things like the character they develop. Are they honest? Are they focused on God's kingdom and eternity? Or are they all about the here and now? Do they look like Jesus? Do they follow his path? So we should look at their character, right? We should look at their actual teaching. Do they point us to Jesus? Or is it about something else? We should look at the influence that they have on other people. What are their followers like? Are they more loyal to Jesus or just loyal to the leader? So Jesus tells us not to look at their appearance, but to look at their fruit. You know, as I've lived my life over the years, I've had the chance to encounter a few folks that in the end I recognized were false prophets. And I remember one guy that I've met in my first ministry. So I think I mentioned him before, but we'll call him Bill. And you know, at first, Bill seemed great. So he he came to our church. He really knew his Bible. He and his family attended very faithfully. He dressed like everybody else. He talked like everybody else. And he even started a Bible study in his home for young married couples. It, It was a new ministry, and this guy was new to our church. And I thought, wow, this guy's really something, man. He is really wants to help the church. He's growing God's kingdom. But I remember the pastor of the church that, you know, told me early on, he said, look, something's not right here. And he said, I'm not sure what this guy's motivation is. And so the pastor kind of did not put him in leadership. And, you know, the pastor knew what he was talking about. You know, as I watched Bill over the years, I started to see the cracks in the facade I went to his Bible study and I could tell, man, okay, this guy wants to be in charge. He does not like to be questioned. He wants to be uh, the, the, the authority. And he, he, you could tell he craved that. Um, then his daughter joined our youth group and you could just sort of tell by the way he talked to her that there were some kind of secrets in this family that probably weren't good. Um, then he got into financial trouble and he didn't handle it in an honest way. And eventually, his wife had a medical problem that debilitated her for a while. And while she was in the hospital, he left her. And he moved on. You know, he was a false prophet. He was a bad spiritual leader. 
Now, I don't give you Bill's story to disparage him or to sit in judgment on him. Maybe he's straightened out and followed Jesus, you know. But I don't believe that's the kind of guy that we should give spiritual authority to. His appearance was good. But a longer, slower look at the fruit that he bore showed us that he was the kind of person Jesus is warning us about. Okay, so the second question that Jesus encourages us to ask is, am I following the right prophet? We want to be careful about those who have spiritual authority in our lives because they can lead us away from the gospel and they can do spiritual damage. Okay, so we should ask ourselves, number one, am I on the right path? And number two, am I following the right prophet? Now, there's one last warning that Jesus gives us, one last question he encourages us to ask, and it's this. Number three, am I making the right profession? Am I making the right profession? Jesus wants us to ask ourselves, do I have the right kind of faith? Am I making the right profession? profession the right affirmation about my faith do I actually know Jesus or do I just know about him okay so let me show you what I mean here um Jesus gives us a very intense warning in verses 21 to 23 so this may be I I think probably is the most disturbing warning in all of scripture look at what he says Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now, in this warning, Jesus is taking his rightful place as Lord and King and Judge of all creation, and he gives us a warning about the basis on which he's going to judge people in the final judgment. And like I said, this is a disturbing warning. You feel me? You, yeah, we know, right? Okay. So I remember the first time I heard this warning, I was nine years old. Uh, I was in an Awana meeting. You know, which was like a Bible club that we had at our church. And I remember the pastor reading this passage. And man, it really made me think. I don't remember anything that the pastor said about the passage. The passage was enough. And once I'd heard that passage, I I never forgot it. Kelly said, some of you maybe have heard of this. If you've heard this passage once, you probably remember it, right? It, It bothered me. And it bothered me for a couple of reasons. First, this passage bothered me because these people have responded to Jesus. Right? I mean, they call him Lord. They they, they say they've served in his name. These are not people who have never heard of Jesus. These are not people who heard about Jesus and said, no, thanks, I don't want that. These are people like us. People who have responded to Jesus in some way. That got my attention. But secondly, and even more disturbingly, these are people who had done things, impressive things, that I had never done. Right? I mean, they claim to have prophesied, to have spoken hidden spiritual truth in the name of Jesus. They claim to have cast out demons in Jesus' name. They claim to have done mighty works, which is Bible talk, for miracles in Jesus name and Jesus doesn't correct them he doesn't say no 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 no. that's all lies you didn't do any of that you know I had never done any of those things by the time I was age nine right and I still haven't done them so when I look at this passage what I realize is these people claim to have responded to Jesus and they have a more impressive spiritual resume than I do and they're not good enough Jesus says they're not going to make it into his kingdom. Now that was and is disturbing, right? So what are we supposed to do with this warning? What do we do about it? Are we supposed to try and outdo these guys? Like make sure our resume is even better than theirs? 
are we supposed to give up? Are we supposed to go, I don't know, who's in and who's out? Jesus is, Jesus is going to do what he's going to do. Is that how we're supposed to respond? What is Jesus calling us to do here? Well, I think the correct response is to examine ourselves. I think Jesus wants us to take a moment to take stock of our lives and see how we fit with what he wants from us. I think we have to examine ourselves, but listen to me carefully. We have to use the right exam. Okay, so we have to look for the right indicators. I mean, notice with me in this passage what does not impress Jesus. First of all, these people know about Jesus, right? They call him Lord. They recognize the objective truth of who he is. They have good theology, if you will. They know about Jesus, but Jesus doesn't commend them for knowing about him. He's not impressed. And secondly, these people have had big moments in Jesus' name, okay? They, they, they claim impressive deeds, but I want you to notice something. Jesus doesn't really address whether these deeds were real or not, right? Which bothers me because I want to know. I'm like, okay, did they actually do this or did they not? But Jesus doesn't say whether these impressive deeds are legitimate or not. So why doesn't he address that? Because impressive deeds are not what he's after. That's not the indicator that Jesus is looking for. He's not impressed with us knowing about him, and he's not impressed with their impressive moments. Notice what impresses Jesus. Notice what he says at the beginning of this third warning. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus isn't interested in big, impressive moments. He's interested in little moments. In our day-to-day -day discipleship, he's interested in the Sermon on the Mount. He's interested in whether they got up in the morning and said, how can I serve Jesus today? How can I follow him and live as a citizen of his kingdom? That's what impresses Jesus. And you know, guys, this should be a huge comfort to us. You know, I think, I think when I first read this passage, I was like, well, these guys have done all this stuff, and apparently that wasn't enough. You need more of that. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I want you to follow me. You don't have to do big, impressive things. You have to follow Jesus. Jesus isn't saying, outdo these guys. He's just saying, be my disciple. Notice in our passage that Jesus gives us two very simple indicators that help us answer this third question. Am I making the right profession? Do I have the right kind of faith? So we should ask ourselves, number one, do I know Jesus? Okay? The question isn't, do you know about him? These guys know about Jesus. They know objectively the claims he makes. They, they know he's Lord, but they don't know him. Notice Jesus says, I never knew you. It's not that these guys knew Jesus and walked with him and then fell along the wayside. Jesus says, I never knew you. So do I know Jesus? Do I have a relationship with God? Do I relate to God as my father? Do I come to him with the things that are going on in my life? Do I talk to him about my daily needs? Do I talk to him about my sin? Do I talk to him about the circumstances of my life? Do I trust him? Do I know him? So the first indicator is, do I know Jesus? And the second indicator is this, am I doing God's will? Jesus says, it's the one who does the will of my Father that enters the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't mean that we work our way to heaven here. The question is, does my relationship to Jesus transform my life? Right? Does my you know, life look more and more like Jesus? Am I going deeper into the life that he provides, the life that he describes in the Sermon on the Mount? Do I know my spiritual poverty? The closer you get to Jesus, the more aware you're going to be of your shortcomings and your sins. It's okay. We, we got to see that in order to change, right? Do I hunger and thirst for righteousness? That's what Jesus says we should do in the Sermon on the Mount. Am I learning to love my enemies? Am I becoming more truthful? More righteous? 
Do I trust God? Do I have a relationship with him? Remember, this is not about being perfect. How does Jesus start the Sermon on the Mount? Blessed are the poor in spirit, those who know their spiritual poverty. Right? It's about Jesus coming into us in our relationship and transforming our lives. So these are the indicators that this third warning calls us to look for. This is the profession, the affirmation of our faith that Jesus wants us to make. Not that we know about him, but that we know him. Not that we've had impressive moments, but that we're doing his will moment by moment. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I was nine years old when I first heard this passage at an Awana meeting. And as you can imagine, in my little nine-year-old brain, I went home and I thought a lot about what I had heard. And I asked myself, if I had actually, if, do I actually have a relationship with Jesus? And the answer was no. I knew a lot of verses because I was learning Bible verses probably about the minute I could speak, okay? And I, I, I knew what my pastor and my parents had told me was true about Jesus. I could sort of give you some of the facts, but I didn't know him. So in my little nine-year-old mind, I just told Jesus that I wanted that. I asked him, can I have a real relationship with you? Can you forgive the wrong things I've done? Even at nine, I knew I wasn't always a good person, okay? I, I, I asked him that, and, 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 and I asked him to make me new. And that's when my walk with Jesus really started. It was a basic decision. But that's when I first truly became a disciple of Jesus. It was because of these warnings. You know, warnings can be useful things. And, and with these warnings, Jesus encourages us to ask, am I choosing the right path? Not is it always hard, but has it ever been hard to follow Jesus? And have I stuck with that? Am I following the right prophet? Are, are my spiritual leaders, people that are pointing me to Jesus, teaching me to depend on God and on the gospel? And am I making the right profession? Do I know about Jesus or do I know him? That's what we want to Let's pray. As we uh, get ready to pray this morning, I just want to say I, um, I would want to make sure that you have the same opportunity today that I had when I was nine years old. I want to invite you to ask yourself if you really know Jesus, if you have a relationship with him, that may sound like a strange thing for you. Maybe you're here today and you're like, I can't imagine talking to Jesus and talking to God as if he were right there with me. But Jesus says that's what he wants. That's what he offers you. A relationship with him. So this morning, if, 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 if you're going, I don't have that, but I want it. I would like to know what it's like to really trust Jesus. I would like to know what it's like when I face that moment that Carla faced this week to just go, hey, I'm in the presence of my Savior. If that's you this morning, I'm just going to invite you to pray along in your heart with me and just say, Lord, I know I'm not perfect. Just in the quietness of your own heart, just say, Lord, I know I'm not perfect. I know that I have sinned. Now, I know that I need a Savior. And I want the life that you promised me through your son, Jesus. I'm thankful that he died for me. I'm thankful that I can be forgiven and made alive through him. And I believe. I don't understand it all, but I believe. And I want to have that relationship with him. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If that was you this morning, let me encourage you. I'm going to be at the door on the way out. Let me just encourage you to pull me aside and mention it to me, or you can fill out a connection card and let us know. But I want to encourage you to follow Jesus with all your heart. Let's worship.
Say 